It's finally time I tackled this subject. I talked about it briefly on the most recent sip and realized that I should get my thoughts on this topic down in some sort of thought out, pre-scripted, organized way without garbling it on stream because that's how I roll. So let's finally examine the question. Are trans women actually women? Well, let's focus on the specifics, namely what we mean when we ask the question, are trans women women? And what lens we're using to try and discover an answer to the question. Conservatives tend to rely on the intuitive answer here, a simple no, often coupled with the pithy remark, define woman. The conservative position here is that woman is defined as adult human female. Because trans women are adult human males, they can't be women. Conservatives generally leave it here because the logic is compact and punchy, but let's actually analyze what makes this view operate. This is where we get to the first lens, the taxonomy view of biological sex. Taxonomy is the science of classification, how we organize a bunch of separate things into groups of things. We use it for libraries, for computers, for finance. But important to us right now is biological taxonomy, specifically sexual taxonomy. I'll just cut right to the heart of it. When it comes to biological life on Earth, we identify males as members of a species that produces small gametes, which is almost always some type of sperm. And we identify females as members of the species that produces large gametes, which is almost always some type of egg. There are some single-celled organisms that reproduce either by cell fission or instead by swapping gametes, but they're so small that the gametes are the same size, meaning neither is really male or female. But those are exceptions. Once we move beyond primitive cellular life, it's all about gamete sizes. It's not about chromosomes. A lot of people like to say it's either XX or XY, but birds, fish, and snakes all have a ZW chromonal system, and yet they still have males and females. Some bugs and bats have an XO system. Moths have a ZO system. The point is that chromosomes aren't enough. Even in humans, somebody can have abnormal chromosomes and still produce large or small gametes. It's not about who has what genitals. It's not about hormones. It's not about who does the penetrating or who carries the child or who raises. Throw all that out the window. It's irrelevant. Sexual taxonomy is determined by the size of the gametes you produce. Almost every species has males and females corresponding to producing small and large gametes respectively. Some species, like earthworms and snails, and a lot of plants, are hermaphroditic, meaning they produce both small and large gametes at the same time. In humans, there are intersex people, but it still comes down to what gametes, if any, they produce. So far, there's been zero documented cases of any human ever producing both sets of gametes. With that being said, let's move on. Consider cattle as a species. Adult males of the species, meaning cattle that can produce small gametes, are called bulls. Adult females, cattle that can produce large gametes, are called cows. Immature cattle are called calves. An immature male, meaning a cattle that cannot yet produce small gametes, but will once he matures, is a bull calf, while an immature female is a heifer. But here's where it gets interesting. A castrated male, meaning a cattle that could produce small gametes, but has a sexual organ surgically removed, is an ox. Oxen are preferable for labor over bulls, being easier to control. You'll find a similar naming convention among a lot of animal species, at least in English. Here's another quick example. For deer, adult males are bucks or stags, depending on the species. Adult females are generally does. Children are generally fawns or kids, depending on species and gender. A sterilized deer is a javier. Sexual taxonomy commonly breaks out into these five classifications, all revolving around gamete production. Immature male, immature female, mature male, mature female, and neuter. In a taxonomic sense, there's no reason that humans would be different than any other animal on Earth. We have children who cannot yet produce gametes but will, boys and girls. We have adults who do produce gametes, men and women. And we have people who can't produce gametes anymore, eunuchs. This schema also applies to intersex and trans people, based on if they produce large gametes, small gametes, or no gametes. So, if we're examining the question of, are trans women actually women, through the lens of human sexual taxonomy, the answer is no. They might produce small gametes, making them men. They might produce no gametes, making them eunuchs. But until we're living in the transhumanist future, where trans women can have a fully functioning uterus and ovaries transplanted into them, they can never produce large gametes, meaning they can never be women. But to some, this is an offensive answer. Humans aren't like animals. We can't use biological sexual classification standards on us the same way that we use them on every other species. We're people. Okay, fair enough. There are other lenses beyond the taxonomy one that are worth considering. Another widely held lens is the social role view. The idea here is that a woman is a person who takes on a socially feminine function, or behaves and presents in a socially feminine manner, or is treated by others in a feminine way. Okay, on this surface, this seems like a fine, trans-inclusive lens to view the problem with. And there are at least a few pro-trans feminists over the years who have agreed with this view, but the more we dig into it, the more problems we begin to unearth. Firstly, what do we mean by taking on a socially feminine function, or behaving and presenting in a socially feminine manner? It's very tough to define what this means in any sort of universal way, like the taxonomy view manages to, especially considering differences in the feminine gender role across culture and time. 
But let's just hand wave that and say, you know, whatever passes for feminine right now in our culture or something. Let's say that we've discovered the universal feminine gender role. There's still a problem here though, and that has to do with the framing of the question. When a progressive is seeking for the answer to the question, are trans women actually women? What they're actually looking for is an answer to the question, are all trans women women? Meaning more specifically, they are seeking a definition of woman that includes all cis women and all trans women, but no cis men or trans men. That is what they require in their fully inclusive definition. Definition. Not a single trans woman is left behind. Does the social role view provide the answer the prog is looking for? Unfortunately for them, no. Regardless of what social role we pin down and say, this is the social role you can adopt to become a woman, it still doesn't include all trans women and exclude all men. There are absolutely extremely submissive men who would take on this feminine gender role. They might even call themselves girl. That's a thing in the gay community for sure, but they don't actually consider themselves women. In the same vein, there are absolutely trans women who would not adopt this gender role. Maybe because they're not out of the closet yet, maybe it's because they don't pass or they never will pass. Hell, there's both trans women and cis women who are very masculine presenting, the butch lesbian types, and they might say things like, women don't owe you femininity. That's a pretty common feminist sentiment, in fact. The problem with the social role view is that trans women who don't perform the role would not be considered women while men who do perform the role would be forced to be women, and the progs can't stand for that. Some of the more radical activists on the left, both trans and not, have adopted the gender abolitionist lens on the topic. For these people, they want to abolish the concept of gender itself. In their ideal world, there is no more man or woman. Gender is a dead concept. Nobody knows what it means anymore. Nobody has the language to describe a difference between a man and a woman. Nobody can recognize the difference between men and women. The human race is all just made up of people who look different from each other. In this view, definitionally, no trans women can be women because there are no women anymore. There are no trans women anymore too. Ignoring the uh, stupidity of this position, even if we take it at face value, the progressive's quest to find a definition of woman that includes all trans women is not fulfilled here because this framework doesn't have a definition of woman at all. It honestly becomes truly incredible to watch a trans woman take this position in real time because it's in complete conflict with the view that nobody is ever socially conditioned into being trans. That's all just conservatives basically calling people groomers. Except by the abolitionists' own logic, everybody is socially conditioned into being trans. There's also the prescriptive lens. Within this framework, the question is reframed as an affirmative statement. Trans women are women isn't a description of reality, but a prescription of what we want reality to be. Kinda like people who hold up signs saying healthcare is a human right. Within a natural rights framework, healthcare is not a right. But even ignoring that, even taking the view that rights flow from the state, in a state where healthcare isn't a right, the statement healthcare is a human right is definitionally false. But they're using it as a prescription, not a description. And the same goes for trans women are women here. In essence, what they're saying is trans women should be women. The argument for this is ultimately going to be based in utility, in good consequences. That society is better off if trans women are women than if trans women aren't women. So trans women should be women. We're gonna have to dive into the postmodernist commie gobbledygook, but let's actually consider this logic. The postmodernists are correct when they say that our language is as it is because it serves some function. I think it was the father of postmodernism, the French philosopher Derrida, who described language as a series of rafts in the ocean that we never actually leave to get to shore. I don't know, I haven't read this guy's stuff since university. The postmodernists are correct when they say that our language is as it is, not because it's immutable, but because it serves some utility to us. For example, when I say the word water, there's three separate things wrapped up in there. There's the word water, which is itself meaningless, it's just a word. A person who doesn't know my language, who hears me say water, is just going to hear random sounds. Then there's the concept of water, which is what I'm thinking of in my head when I say water. And when I say to you, this is water, I'm hoping you have the same concept in your head of water that I do, so that I'm conveying to you not just the sound of the word, but the meaning that I intend. And then there's actually the physical substance that is water the clear, tasteless, odorless liquid that is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. That substance, the substance of water, I can never truly get to it with language alone. I just described it to you there, but it's not like water poured out of your headphones or something. Description of the thing is not the thing itself, and the only way to know water is to experience water beyond language. There are even some more hardcore postmodernists called anti-realists who think that it's impossible to know water even if you touch it or taste it because your senses are still subjective and a product of your own mind and that there's no real world beyond human perception. But if you're going to go down the ultimate skeptic rabbit hole, all of reality breaks down and it's honestly pretty retarded because nobody actually lives their life that way. In my opinion, there does seem to be a world beyond human perception of it and words can convey meaning without truly knowing that world. 
We called water, water, long before we knew what hydrogen and oxygen was. And yet, the meaning remained, even as we learned more about what it was. Sometimes meanings change with new knowledge. But nonetheless, it does seem to be the case that a lot of language does at least point to something real, even if it's not the thing itself. So, the prescriptive view of gender is, if all of language is this postmodernist series of rafts, and we construct it all to point at real-world phenomenon in a way that is useful to us, then we should construct woman to include trans women. The issue is that useful for us part. The taxonomy view that we discussed back at the start of the video is actually the natural end result of this prescriptivist view. We find it useful to classify different types of a species by their reproductive capability. And man and woman for humans is no different. Most men, when they say that they are romantically attracted to women, they have packed into that label, biologically female, capable of having heterosexual sex, capable of carrying children, and trans women can't do any of that. The common prog reply at this point is, would you say that a woman who can't carry children isn't a woman? And the truth is, believe it or not, a lot of people, both men and women, do consider that to be the case. Like it sucks, it's a, it's a shitty reality, I'm sure it's offensive to many people. But the human taxonomy view views these people as neuter. And for most of human history, we've had no problem saying it. And this is where the social engineering part of the conversation comes into play. If leftoids can push the culture into a position where most people no longer find utility in using gender in this way, then the prescriptive view of gender would necessarily desync with the taxonomic view. That's why it's prescriptive. It's saying we should do this. It's a moral statement, not a statement of fact. But that's a problem for the prog if we're talking about the question, are trans women actually women? The prescriptive answer is they're not and they should be, but that's still a no. And it always will be until we reach a point that the majority culture no longer cares about biological sex when it comes to finding a partner. And frankly, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. So, when the progressive seeks to find a definition of woman that includes all trans women while excluding all men, nothing seems to fit. The taxonomy view says that none of them are. The social role view includes some trans women, but not all of them, and it includes some men too. The abolitionist view says no, because there are no women at all. The prescriptive view also says no, but it focuses on what should be rather than what the truth actually is. It's at this point the progressive falls into the ultimately arbitrary position that is necessarily the end result of the social engineering deep within the prescriptive view, the self-identification lens. Most people who consider the prescriptive view end up abandoning utility once they recognize that most people actually find a lot of utility in differentiation based on reproductive ability. So they abandon utility in favor of harm reduction. At this point, it doesn't matter what the objective truth is, or if it even exists. It doesn't matter if some people prefer the current definitions. If we are the ones that can choose what all this shit means, we should just open the doors and let everybody identify as what they want to minimize the harm that comes with gatekeeping. Therefore, the self-ID lens is one where anybody who self-identifies as a woman is a woman. There are no qualifiers other than identification. On the surface, it seems like the question, are trans women actually women, is definitionally true now. They are women because we've defined them as women. And if there are any trans women out there who don't make the cut by some other metric, don't worry about it because we've completely unmoored the concept of woman from any measurable metric. It's simply a class that you can belong to by virtue of identifying as belonging to it. Now, a conservative would immediately say, this is a circular definition. You see this a lot. Define woman, anyone who identifies as a woman. You can't use the word in its own definition, that's circular. And this is true. This is a criticism you can't really get out of with word games. The definition of woman is a, a person that identifies as such. What does such refer to here in your sentence, you brainlet? You haven't actually changed anything. You've just subbed out woman for a variable that directly means woman and brings nothing else to the table. It's still circular, you're just too dumb to recognize it. But often, the conservative stops thinking here and says, aha, I'm correct, it is circular. But let's keep going. Let's examine exactly what the problem is. Conservatives are deliberately ignorant to the point that they're not capable of talking about any of these issues. Can you go over circular arguments like real quick? There's no such thing. Guys, there's no reason a definition can't be circular. Not that my definition of woman is, but it doesn't have to be. People, like people start pretending there are all these like rules about what a definition can be. There aren't. Words can mean literally anything. The reason we choose definitions and use them is to serve utility, but they never get to that point in the argument. I wish I could get to that point in an argument with a conservative. I'm sure Vosh considers me a conservative. And for your sake, buddy, because I like you a lot, I am happy to directly engage with your question. He's partially correct. This is Derrida's observation of language being a series of rafts again. But on the other hand, you can detallow the Neutelov until it reached Parkst, then keep the part that was both Tanir and Hawk. Is the Ton Wo Roy or Becca Freud? What did I just ask you there? What meaning did I just convey to you? Language can mean anything, but it does have to mean something that we all agree upon in order to be useful. Otherwise, it's just individuals using their own private languages that aren't actually communicating any meaning. 
Here's the thing, any highly complicated class that involves multiple traits is actually really hard to define. For example, what's a chair? Four legs with a seat and a back that people sit on? I mean, yeah, but that's also a horse. What's a car? Something with wheels? Is a truck a car? I mean, maybe. Is a motorcycle a car? Well, if it needs more than two wheels, how about a motorcycle with a sidecar? How about a car with three wheels? How about a broken car with no wheels? If it needs an engine, is a lawnmower a car? If it needs to run on gas, is an electric car a car? If an electric car actually is a car, is a golf cart a car? Every single definition for every classification has fuzzy edges. And frankly, gender, even sex, is no different. Male and female are still categories that we made up. It's not like the word male or female is printed on our cells if you zoom in with a microscope. XX and XY might be there, sure, but again, it's possible for an XX person to produce small gametes, even though the overwhelming majority of them produce large gametes, and vice versa for an XY. We notice that organisms produce small gametes, large gametes, or no gametes, but we still choose to use that as a basis for a classification of male, female, and neuter. When we're talking about man and woman, we notice a collection of traits. We notice that they largely fit into two groups, and we notice that identifying those groups as two separate things brings us utility. Consider type 2 diabetes, you know, the type that I probably have. It's ultimately arbitrary that we choose a certain amount of insulin resistance to qualify for diabetic, pre-diabetic, and not diabetic at all. It could have been a few percentage points different either way, but nonetheless, the label of diabetic obviously brings us some utility, and it does point at something real, even if its barriers are constructed by us. This is the deep problem with Vosh's position. He says that everything's just a social construct, and that's true. But then he says that because everything is a social construct, therefore we can just make everything the way we want it to be, and that is false. One, it requires broad consensus to truly change the meaning of language, not just bullying a dictionary into compliance by ratioing them on Twitter. And two, we have the language that we do because that language points at something in reality. It is constructed, but it's not really arbitrary. It's the result of our observations of the world. And even if we do observe edge cases, exceptions generally prove the rule. Additionally, when we're talking about gender and sex, the edge cases aren't trans people, they're intersex people. And it's frankly annoying when trans activists co-op intersex talking points to try and legitimize their views. So when Vosh says there's no reason definitions can't be circular, he's referring to Derrida's rafts. And fair enough, if you dig deep enough, all definitions are circular. Quick example, in the Oxford Dictionary, what is a woman? An adult female human being. What's a female? Of or denoting the sex that can bear offspring or produce eggs, distinguished biologically by the production of large gametes. What's a gamete? A male or female cell that joins with the cell of the opposite sex to form a zygote. Well, we've circled back around to female again. What's a zygote? A single cell that develops into a person or an animal, formed by the joining together of a male and female gamete. It's very common to find definitions that circle back in on themselves in a few steps. The issue is whether or not the interlocking web of circular references ever actually communicates any meaning through the act of referencing. Here's what I mean. Let's say that you've never felt the softness of a newborn baby's skin. I haven't, I, I, I've heard it soft. So because I've never felt it, when you tell me that it feels soft, that doesn't really help me too much. It might help me a bit if I know what soft is, but I have no idea how soft it is. But if you were to tell me it's softer than silk, because I know how soft silk feels, I am now a lot closer at understanding what you're saying. This idea is probably best described in Frank Jackson's thought experiment, Mary's Room, where Mary is a scientist who has lived her entire life in a black and white room. During that time, she studied everything there is to know about the color red. All scientific data anyone's ever written about, all descriptions in prose, everything humanity's ever documented about the color red. She's even seen black and white pictures and video of everything that's ever existed, but she's never seen the color red herself. When Mary leaves the black and white room and sees the color red for the first time, does that experience, experiencing what red actually looks like, constitute new knowledge? To me, the answer seems to be yes. The experience of red itself cannot be rationalistically described, but it's still a form of knowledge missing in the verbal and written descriptions of what red is. The point of the Mary's Room thought experiment is that experience is a form of knowledge that you can't directly get at through language, but language combined with experience can lead to new knowledge on the edges of your understanding. That's the softer than silk comment from earlier. Somebody like Mary, with all of her rational knowledge, after experiencing the colors red and blue for herself, might be able to say red is like blue, but it has these differences. Her ability to describe those differences are fleshed out by her rational knowledge, but the experience of seeing them forms the foundation. Putting it simply, although Derrida is correct that we never leave the rafts of language, that doesn't mean that we're not in sight of the shoreline. Language is circular, but it's the web of references combined with our own experience that allows us to express meaning.
So when Vosh says something like, it doesn't matter if it's circular, anything can be anything, and we're going down the self-ID rabbit hole where the word woman has no qualifiers attached, no experience in the real world is necessary to provide the foundation for knowledge to exist. What does woman mean? It seems to be an empty word. Maybe that's why the UN defines woman as limitless and formless. But that also means that no meaning is communicated when you say the word woman. If we're going by this standard, the word woman means nothing at all. And if it's a word without meaning, then everything and anything and nothing can be a woman or not be. The progressive search for a definition of woman that includes all trans women but no men necessarily falls apart here. Because everything, including men, are simultaneously women and not women. But let's continue down the rabbit hole anyway, just in case you're not convinced yet. Let's say that on my desk, I have all sorts of knickknacks. My wallet, my phone, my headphones, books, pens, old receipts, Funko Pop statues. You know, random assorted junk. And now let's say that I tell you on my desk, I have an object known as a blarg. Blargs are only identified by one feature, that is the feature of being a blarg. I can't tell you anything else about what a blarg is. It has no other qualifiers. With only what I've told you, can you pick out which object on my desk is a blarg? The answer is no, because the word blarg conveys no meaning. That is the problem with circular definitions that are immediately circular in zero steps. It's that they relate back to no other experiences through the web of reference, and therefore they provide no meaning. So consider the statement, a woman is anybody who identifies as a woman. If we were to sub out the second instance of woman there, we would get the statement, a woman is anybody who identifies as identifying as a woman. And then if we were to do another round of recursion, it would be a woman is anybody who identifies as identifying as identifying as a woman. And this definition recurses infinitely, never getting to a point where it references an experience and therefore never actually containing any knowledge. Moreover, in the real world, people don't actually do this. A woman might be somebody who identifies as a woman, sure, but does she identify as identifying as a woman? Does she identify as identifying as identifying as a woman? It simply becomes absurd. Nobody does this, and so nobody's woman, including trans women. The common prog objection to this logic simply falls back on Derrida's rafts of language. That it's all constructed, and nothing ever gets back to anything other than words. But that's because these people are so ideologically captured by postmodernism that they reject the idea that meaning in language comes from the web of references that appeals to experiences outside of the language itself, because they reject experience itself. That's a whole can of worms I'm not gonna go down right now. If you want a taste of it though, sit back and notice just how many leftoids reject experience a priori in favor of rationalistic planning in work, in school, in politics. The broader left is rife with the view that having a good idea is more important than executing good action. But we can go even deeper. It's not enough that the phrase, a woman is anybody who identifies as a woman, is circular and therefore conveys no meaning. It's not enough that attempting to find meaning in that circularity anyway results in an infinite number of identifications that no candidate for womanhood would ever perform. It's also that the logic itself, ignoring the circularity, is still wrong. Consider the blarg on my desk again. What kind of object could it possibly be having only one quality, that of being a blarg? What quality could possibly exist that fulfills that logic? Put other qualities into the equation and see what I mean. A tall person is anyone who identifies as being tall. Well, that's obviously false. You can be tall without identifying as being tall. You can identify as being tall without being tall. What about being a gamer? You can be a gamer without identifying as being a gamer. Then you're just a person who plays video games but rejects the identity of gamer while frankly still having it. You can identify as being a gamer without being one. This is the fake gamer girl who doesn't actually play games, for example. I can be somebody who has cancer but not identify as having cancer because it's undiagnosed. Inversely, I can identify as having cancer but not actually have cancer because I'm a hypochondriac. It is universal that being a thing and identifying as being a thing are not linked concepts because being a thing refers back to some sort of experience-based referential knowledge, while identifying as being a thing is a product entirely of your own self-perception, and that perception can be wrong. Let's say that your parents told you you were born in Toronto. As such, you identify as somebody born in Toronto, but it turns out your parents lied. You were actually born in Ottawa. You may self-ID as somebody born in Toronto, but that self-ID is incorrect. It doesn't map onto the real world experience of what your life actually is. The logic behind a woman is anybody who identifies as a woman is still wrong, independent of any sort of circular definition problem, because what you identify as could be incorrect, and it's impossible to have a quality that exists only if you identify as having it. Consider any other sort of emotion-based choice instead of identify, and you'll see the same problems pop up. Like, consider desiring instead. Are you tall if you desire to be tall? Obviously not. Are you an athlete if you desire to be an athlete? Though I will make note here that a lot of motivational and inspirational perspectives put forward the idea that you are the thing you desire, not because you actually are, but because thinking you are is part of the mind state that helps you accomplish the goal. So you're not actually a professional basketball player, but if you keep the identity of professional basketball player in your mind, it may become easier to do the day-to-day -day grind of actually becoming a professional basketball player. Same with telling yourself, I'm an artist, to motivate yourself to create art. 
The language of the fake it until you make it mentality directly mimics the I am what I identify as attitude in the trans conversation, but only to streamline the process of performing the real world behaviors that will actually transform you into the thing that you're claiming to be. Trans activists don't use the language in this way. All that being said, we're still talking about the progressives question of are all trans women actually women? And the self ID view fails that question spectacularly. At first glance, it seems to answer the question in the way the progs want. But as soon as you actually engage your brain and think about it even a little bit, the logic completely falls apart. Some people will feel the need to hand wave all these objections away, saying it doesn't matter if the logic doesn't work, trans women are women, and whoever identifies as a woman is one, but that's just special pleading. What they're really saying is, I'm a-okay with this one specific domain being a place where none of the rules of logic or language or meaning actually apply as long as it gets me my desired political outcome, which is an attitude that is, frankly, directly in opposition to the pursuit of knowledge. So, finally. Here we are, at the end of the progressive analysis on this question, with no answers that will ever actually satisfy the progressive. In the taxonomic view, no trans women are women, because they will never produce large gametes. In the social role view, some trans women are women and some aren't, while some men are also women. In the abolitionist view, no trans women are women because women as a category and trans women as a category don't exist. In the prescriptive view, the statement is trans women should be women, but there's no claim of whether or not trans women are women. And in the self-ID view, the term woman ends up being an empty word with no meaning, making everything and everyone simultaneously woman and not woman, including a bunch of people that the progs want explicitly not to be women, like cis men. Each of the five lenses fail to fulfill the progressive's agenda when it comes to the question of, are all trans women actually women? So what do we do now? Personally, I don't care. I'm not a progressive. I'm not chained to this requirement that all trans women be women. I'm perfectly happy to gatekeep some people who claim to be trans women out of the label of woman. And that attitude frees us to consider two more possible positions. The first one is that simply trans women aren't women at all. When I talk to trans women who aren't ideologically captured by the left, they generally say they're okay with not being women, they just don't want to be treated as men. They know that they don't fulfill the taxonomy view of what a woman is, but they also don't fulfill the social role view of what a man is. And in terms of that taxonomy view, they're often neuter, producing no gametes, depending on if they've had certain types of surgery or how long they've been on hormones. For them, if trans woman is just its own separate thing, distinct from both men and women, they're fine with that. And I can see the logic here. For example, trans women have medical needs that are different from both men and women. The attitude of, I don't care what you view me as. If trans women aren't women, but just its own thing, fine. Just leave me alone so I can have my private life. That's a pretty common view among trans women who aren't activists. And to me, that seems perfectly reasonable. 10 years ago, the left had a winning argument, a knockout punch on this topic. And it's this. Women are adult human females, but to be kind and decent, we should respect people's identities in a polite society. However, there are some areas of life where biological sex should win out, like for example, in women's sports. There you go, conversation over. We respect the biological reality that underpins human sexual taxonomy, while understanding that in a liberal society, there should be reasonable accommodations made for the outliers. Also, while not allowing the outliers to rule over all of society from the margins. This is a conception of trans acceptance that doesn't demand other people think that all trans women are women, and there's no difference between them, or any other brain dead nonsense like that. You don't genuinely need to believe that a trans woman is a woman deep in your heart of hearts in order for trans women to still have a place at the table. You simply need to not be an asshole. This was the winning leftist position 10 years ago, and the left abandoned it in order to directly defy reality and logic with the insistence that everyone else must be true believers. For them, it's not enough that you're polite. You must view reality the exact way they do through their exact lens with their exact logic, even if it breaks, or else you're a transphobe. Utter nonsense. The second new position is that trans women are women, but that most of the people we see right now claiming to be trans aren't actually trans. And in order to explain that, I'm gonna to need to explain the concept of gender dysphoria. Actually, we're like half an hour into the video and I can't believe I haven't covered this yet. Gender dysphoria is what we call the distress experienced by a person due to the mismatch between their gender and their biological sex. In this conversation, biological sex is the physical reality of your body, the primary and secondary sexual characteristics, while gender is the internal feeling and experience of that biology. If you're a cis man, in terms of your body, you've got a functioning dick. In terms of your brain, you're expecting a dick to be there and to be able to do dick things with it. Those two things line up and you're good to go. From what we understand so far, in a person with gender dysphoria, their brain is expecting a different body to what they're hooked up to. The common analogy used is like a computer with the wrong drivers installed. We don't know why people experience dysphoria, but there's some evidence for a lot of very different causes. It might be an effect of puberty, which passes when puberty is complete. It might be a side effect of depression or abuse. 
It might be the result of hormonal changes within the mother that the fetus is exposed to. It might be a genetic abnormality. It might be all of these things, we just don't know enough yet. And before leftoids start coping, yes, this is clearly a mental illness. If you're one of those idiots who says it's not, then you have no place in this conversation. If dysphoria isn't a mental illness that causes distress, why do people transition to treat it then, you fucking mongoloid? Here's the thing though, back when we discussed that social role lens, I mentioned the femboys, gay men who look, speak, and act feminine, who adopt a feminine gender role in their relationships and sometimes in society, but they're not trans. They don't view themselves as women, they're still men, they're just feminine men. They don't fit into this view of gender dysphoria, and that's probably why so many trans activists out there end up being toxic as fuck egg hatchers trying to push feminine men into being trans, because femboys are a giant red flag that our current understanding of gender dysphoria doesn't quite make sense. This is just my personal theory, I only have my intuition to go on here. But I've spoken to a bunch of trans women at this point, and I've asked them all if they could wake up tomorrow as cis women with a real vagina and uterus and ovaries and an annoying monthly cycle and the chromosomes and all the rest of it, they would. To me, that sounds like what they're experiencing isn't gender dysphoria, it's better described as sex dysphoria. It's not that trans women want to be women, that's only a part of it. They want to be female from birth. They literally want to be adult human females. They can't be, obviously, but transitioning and becoming more female-like is how they alleviate the stress of not being female. The social role stuff, the passing, the behavior, that's all part of it, and they take what they can get, but the thing they really want, the thing that is forever out of reach, is the biology. This is why the social role view is part of it, but it's not enough. What does it mean to feel being female? Is it liking to cook, or liking the color pink, or being attracted to masculine men? A lot of women are like that, but a lot of gay men are like that too. There's still that biological component in feeling a deep mismatch between your mind and your body. I know it's not exactly the female brain in a male body analogy. We've got some evidence through brain scans that trans women's brains straddle the space between cis men and cis women. And the whole topic is way more complicated, but that view works for this conversation. Additionally, the taxonomy view isn't enough either. Let's say that you're somebody who is a strict believer in the woman is an adult human female thing. Okay, when you see a person who looks like a woman at the grocery store, what exactly are you going to do before you decide to call them sir or ma'am? Are you going to test her gametes where you treat her like a woman? Most of us don't get to verify that sort of thing in a public setting, unless you're pretty creepy. Even for people who claim to follow a strictly biological lens in this conversation, in casual situations, they will still put on the social role lens, just because it's quicker and easier. That's why it was so funny to listen to Ben Shapiro on Joe Rogan intuitively call Blair White she, and then immediately forcing himself to say he in order to try and maintain his political position. In normal day-to-day -day living, most people forget about biology and default to some version of the social role view in casual circumstances. If they look like a woman, then they are one, and if they don't, they don't. You see a lady in a dress with long hair, looks pretty feminine, you're not going to ask a question about biology, you're going to assume, oh, that's a woman. This might suck for people who can't pass, but it is how the majority of people function. If dysphoria is the issue, and it's not just going away with time or, or alleviation of other problems, then we have two choices make the brain more masculine, or make the body more feminine, to bring the two in line. And so far, it seems like making the brain more masculine is way, way tougher than making the body more feminine. A lot of people on the right say these people need help, not transitioning, failing to realize that transitioning is the help. Success rates for various forms of therapy to masculinize the brain are uh, abysmal, way worse than the success rates to feminize the body, which frankly, um, already aren't great. But all of this is only legitimate if the dysphoria is both present and unchanging. There's a new wave of trans activism which declares, as a natural end result of that self-ID view, that you don't even need dysphoria to be trans. You just need to identify as being trans. Nowadays, if you believe that dysphoria is required, then you're a trans medicalist, which is a negative word used to describe people who think that being trans is fundamentally a medical phenomenon. But the people who believe that you don't need dysphoria to be trans are probably the single dumbest group I've spoken about in this video more than any other. If you can simply identify as another gender, then why transition at all? Just identify as the gender associated with your birth sex, and dysphoria goes away, lol. Obviously, that's not how it works. The issue ultimately is, if we take the entire class of people that the progs would call trans women, we see within it, broadly, two categories. In the first category, we see people who, even though they're biologically male, they have an affinity for femininity that goes beyond free will. They've been like this their whole lives, and they can't choose not to be. For them, nothing works, nothing alleviates their pain, with the exception of transitioning. They have something more, something deeper than just identification. They have a female essence in their body language, in their behavior, in the way that they speak, that is, unfortunately, at war with their own male biology. In the second category, we see people who have chosen to identify as women. And if you don't accept their self-ID, you're a bigot. There's no feminine essence to appeal to here. There's no sense that they can't help but be in this unfortunate situation. There's only narcissism. 
If there is truly a place for trans women to actually be women, it's going to be along these lines. The feminine essence that they can't help but embody, that shows itself not as a self-ID, but as an uncontrollable affinity. The issue is, ultimately, that the self-ID view of this topic is just the gender abolitionist view in disguise. Self-ID advocates know that their politics, if ever widely adopted, destroys gender as a concept. In a way, the TERFs are correct when they say that trans activists want to destroy the concept of woman. The two positions outside of the progressive framework are, ironically enough, the two most pro-trans coherent positions. The first, where trans women aren't women, and that's fine because they're also not men. The second, where people who have an innate and uncontrollable affinity towards female biology are women. The second one includes all cis women and all trans women who have gender dysphoria, but it excludes all of the trans trenders, all the people who say you don't need dysphoria to be trans, all the people who do it because it's a trendy aesthetic. All of those people aren't women. This is the only logically coherent framework by which at least some trans women are women that also excludes men. This is the most pro-trans position possible that actually makes sense, and the progs reject it. They would rather wreck the concept of woman entirely than compromise and get at least some of their stated goals, because their actual goal is to wreck the concept of woman. But to somebody who isn't ideologically captured by leftism, both of these positions are reasonable compromises. You'll find that off Twitter, off campus, and off the left, most trans people just want to chill and be left alone. They're not going to demand that you religiously believe that they're women. They're just going to want you to be polite to them if you have to interact, and not shout at them in the middle of the store because they can't pass or you clock them or something. And you know what? That's a perfectly reasonable thing to want. So, to answer the question once and for all, are trans women actually women? In almost all views, the answer is necessarily no. There is a view that allows some people who claim to be trans women to be women, but there is no view that allows all trans women to be women. And progressives reject the most coherent trans positive position, not because they want to include more trans people in the acceptance, but because trans people are simply their political pawns, and they are happy to use, abuse, and discard them as such.